Coming up on Chopper's Politics. Ja, es kommt gleich auf Chopper's Politics Greg Hans hier im Gespräch. One of Rishi's top five priorities, as you know, stop the boats. I know. I wish him joy. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Chopper's Politics Podcast. I'm Christopher Hope, the Associate Editor for Politics at The Telegraph. You're joining me in a pub, but not the Red Lion in Whitehall. We're in the Anchor Pub in Ringma, near Lewis. It's a Lib Dem Green council area that the Tories are looking to win in next week's local elections in England. And we're here with local Tory MP Maria Caulfield and Greg Hans, the Conservative Party chairman, who also speaks very good German, as you've just heard. Now, earlier, we stepped out to watch them knocking on some doors and we listened in to what some voters had to say. Good afternoon. Hello. 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 Hi. 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 You're like Wendy. <laughs> Greg Hans, chairman of the party. Oh, hello. Sorry, my hand's a bit nice cold, but so nice to meet you. Thank you, for, thank you for coming to the door and having I'm, a break. I've been up and down the country the last three weeks, um, from yes. Ramsgate to Hartlepool, from Accrington down to Worcester. I've yet to have a conversation which has worsened by mentioning Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister. Always, always improves the mood, the disposition towards the Conservatives to us. So that is definitely uh, an electoral asset. I think kind of the opinion <laughs> well, on that should be basic. reflects in large part what the opinion polls yeah. are saying. That but that should, that should be a basic thing. You've mentioned the leader's name. It shouldn't be able to make things go get worse. But are you saying it did that with previous leaders? Maybe Boris Johnson Well, I wasn't party trust. chairman at the time. No. Um, so <laughs> I was but typically not... you were an MP. Not, we are an MP. Yeah, yeah but, um, you know, he's my... Uh, he was a device. Everyone's own constituency. Yes won't give you a national picture, whereas at no. the moment you know, yeah. my, my picture is a bit more national, although it's, you know, I mean, you're still ultimately uh, yes. you know, speaking to hundreds of people and to do a representative opinion poll, you need to speak to thousands of people, yeah, of but, but I've yet to have anybody come to the door and say, I really think the answer is Keir Starmer. You know, that, I think, is, uh, is also a quite an encouraging sign. I don't always agree with what you're doing, of course, and I do wish you'd get the civil servants back to work. Mm. I was a civil servant in the Home Office for 40 oh, yeah. years. Really? Gosh, 40 okay. years. And I worked in the Asylum Directorate for the last few of those. And the yeah. mere fact that they say now they're doing one case a week is preposterous. Oh, we're, may, we're, be, we're doing a big increase on that. We've oh, got it off the to, one a week yeah. to help clear the backlog. That's a big part of, as you know, we passed uh, passing the legislation this week in the House of Commons. Labour, Lib Dems all voted against the boats legislation. But we're putting the legislation through goes off to the Lords, Lords next now. and yeah. we'll see what the Lords do. <laughs> but, no, but you know, we've got to keep at it, we'll keep pushing it through. That's what the British people want us to do. It's one of Rishi's top five priorities, as you know, stop the boats. I know. I wish him joy. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think he's doing? <laughs> Jury's still out. <laughs> okay. 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 Are you missing the previous Prime Minister but I one? Boris, like Boris. And I voted for Liz Truss. And I still think she had some good ideas. It's just she went about them the wrong way. Yep. So I really don't like the way they've really smashed her, you know, <laughs> the, the media and everything. Right. Because I thought she could have done a good job, OK. But Rishi's, do it gradually. Rishi Sunak's five yeah, priorities, halving inflation, mm-hmm. growth, cutting the debt, cutting the hospital waiting list, stopping the boats, that seems like the right thing. Well, it's Yes, yes, if it all works. Yeah, yeah. well, I think we'll Absolutely. make it great. <laughs> and what do you think locally? Because you've got three green councillors here. What, what's your what's your thoughts for I next week? I just sort of tend to vote Conservative because I always do. Yeah. Very <laughs> sensible. Well, well, yeah. Not entirely <laughs> the idea. But, yeah. Well, I, there's not, to my mind, although I'm not always with the Conservatives, what they do, there's just no viable alternative. The sort of yeah. Labour getting in fills me with horror and always has. Yeah. <laughs> and Lib Dems, well, they're never going to get in on their own. They're only going to be sitting on someone else's they'll back. Be, they'll be propping they? up Keir Starmer. Mm, yeah. 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 So, so here, the danger, I think, if you get a Lib Dem MP again, is that they will vote to put Keir Starmer in number 10, which would be a total disaster. Yeah. So I do hope you get your seat ne- back next year. No, but thank you. Mm. Well, Maria's <laughs> yeah. a brilliant MP. It was t- last time as well. So thank you very much, Steve, for your time. And um, oh, thank nice you very much, Steve, your, yeah. your support for Maria. Yeah. She's a brilliant MP and a great minister, a great, great person around, just knows health 
being a practicing yeah, nurse that's another and issue, knows isn't it? the yeah, issues really well. Yeah. We've just won this battle in court, but it's just going to put their backs up, isn't it? So well, we're in for well, more trouble. Get, get back around the table and negotiate on the pay, so, yeah. yeah. It's a yeah. nightmare, really, all these strikes. It's the teachers today. I notice yeah. more children are out because yeah. the teachers are out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very yeah, much thank indeed. you very much. <laughs> thank nice you. to see nice you. Yeah. you. Okay, thank you for your support. Okay. Okay. So, Maria, are you finding it is... Um, they, they like Rishi right. here? They do like Rishi, yeah. yes. I think they... Um, they just quite like the fact that he's okay. very focused, he's got his five priorities mm. and they know what he's about. If so. he delivers, that's okay, but if it doesn't, yeah. if they can still stay high, the boats aren't stopped yet, all those things. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, I mean, mean, that's exactly what to deliver, they say. Right? Yeah, they, they like what he wants to do, but they want to see results. It's Greg Hans and Maria Caulfield from the Conservatives. Hello, hi. Hello. After the voters of Ringma had their go, it was my turn to grill the party chairman, Greg Hans back at the Anchor pub. Greg Hans, Tory party chairman, we're now sitting down. That was quite a walk. You walk very quickly for a man of your middle uh, middle year youth. Yes, middle youth. I like that, Christopher. <laughs> oh, I, I was like going that. down the wrong way with that conversation. I like but, that. Uh, I I'm 57, myself. but I like to get from A to B quickly. How many steps are you doing a day? Are you monitoring? I don't know. I think at the last general election, I was doing about 30,000. I think I'm not doing that many this time. Uh, there's quite a bit of travel between constituencies, yes. so... I was down in Hastings earlier and then took the train from Hastings to Lewis and then we'll take the train back to London. So yes. in between... You weren't chairman Spurs. last time, you were just a candidate last time, weren't you? That's correct, yeah, in Chelsea and Fulham, yeah. How many council seats will you lose next week? Well, look, I, I don't know. The independent forecasters, you know, the real experts in this space, Rallings and Thrasher, uh, Professor John Curtis, all of them are saying that Conservatives will lose a 1,000 seats and I don't for a moment doubt it will be a difficult set of elections for the party. These seats were last fought in 2019, which was a very bad time for Labour. It was the last year of Corbyn in charge. It was just the run-up, if you like, to the 2019 general election, which is obviously very bad for Labour. Uh, I don't know, but what I do find is that our activist base, our councillors, our council candidates are working really hard and I'm finding them upbeat. Mm. But so as I say, credible? the independent, the independent thousand... forecasts are a thousand losses. I mean, in electoral calculus say 500, a thousand is a worst case, but what do you, what's your internal number? Are you, are you massaging expectations in the pub? Well, I, I, don't have a, I don't have an internal number. And what I do know is that the independent academics, yes. you know, who probably know best, okay. uh, are saying a thousand losses. What does success look like? I think success Obviously not a thousand. Success looks like... I wouldn't put a number on success. I think success is actually much more down to where the government is heading overall on delivering the five priorities. Halving inflation, restoring growth, cutting debt, reducing hospital waiting lists and stopping yes. the boats. That is the That's the last success. time That's you can say them on this. Like. That's literally 30 seconds of my time with you. You can't keep doing that. When we, <laughs> I know you're told to do it by number 10. We'll, we'll come to but those in a minute. You asked me the question, what does success look like? <laughs> and success is delivering on the five priorities. But I'm thinking about next week at the local elections rather yeah. than at the bigger picture, which you're quick to go to. You've been on the doorsteps today. We've met some people. Do they miss Boris Johnson, your last leader but one? Well, I, I think Boris is, is still an asset for the party. And He's not still, campaigning, is he, though? He's not helping. Uh, well, I, I, we'll see. We'll see. But uh, crucially, I find that even people who like Boris Johnson, none of them, none of the ones that I've met, think that Rishi Sunak is not doing a good job. So uh, 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 whenever I'm on the doorstep, I always find that mentioning Rishi Sunak as prime minister improves the conversation. He polls well. In my direction. He polls well. And even people who like Boris... Uh, they're not exclusive to people who think Rishi's doing a good job and like Rishi. In other words, you can definitely both like Boris, you can like Boris, you can like Liz, you can also like Rishi. Do you want him to to help campaign? He's a great campaigner. He reaches the parts of this country others can't reach. Well, look, I mean, I've known Boris for 30 years. I've been out campaigning with Boris uh, when he was mayor of London. I remember once I got asked by the party to organise a walkabout uh, (laughs) down King's Road in my constituency. And I organised a walkabout for the hour he's going to be with us, get halfway down the King's Road. Of course, we never made it further than the newspaper seller outside Sloan Square Station. Um, he was mobbed at that time. He was very, very popular as Mayor of London. Um, he is definitely a campaigning asset for the Conservative Party. But we'll have to see uh, what Boris uh, is going to do for the next election. But how about next week? I mean, getting the vote out on the council elections. Have you asked him to help? Well, I think that's uh, kind of down to Boris at the moment. Mm. Um, you know, he's just been uh, readopted as candidate uh, for Uxbridge and South Ryslip. 
and uh, you know the party will support him in that. But we'll have to see what yeah. Boris will want to do next year. Is it the battle of the boring at the moment, Sunak v Starmer? No, I don't think so, because I think people see uh, Rishi Sunak as actually getting on with the job. And actually what they want to see is a period of delivery, uh, dealing with the difficult challenges facing the country, high inflation, high energy prices, the Vladimir Putin challenge on the security side, uh, making sure that uh, the uh, uncontrolled migration in the channel, the boats is sorted out. There's quite a lot of things that I think people want to see sorted out at the moment. That's what we're focusing on, the people's priorities. It does hang on those priorities, the five things you mentioned there. Inflation is still in double figures. It's meant to fall to single figures, wasn't it, in February? It hasn't happened yet. Uh, the economy is, is going to be just growing this year, maybe. Stop the boats. Well, that hasn't started yet. When, when are the first flights to Rwanda? We don't know. Problem with NHS waiting this caused by strikes, possibly debt might fall. I mean, these are things which some of which are outside of the PM's control. And if you don't get them right, you're letting down voters, aren't you? And you're, you're losing the point of voting for Sunak. In the first I mean, the first thing to say is that nobody pretended the five priorities, delivering on the five priorities was going to be easy. The mm. idea is that Only one of them is this year, isn't it? That which, which is half inflation. The rest are not time limited. Is that right? Well, uh, you know, we'll, have to, we'll have to see. But the five priorities were not designed to be easy things, easy things to achieve. They are pushing the government, pushing the government in making sure that we deliver on those five things. It's all about delivery at the moment. That's what the people want to see. They want to see their government uh, getting on with what is a difficult situation. We've inherited a high inflation, high energy prices, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. That is, if you like, the difficult hand that's been dealt the government. Well, you're saying, you're saying how it is. You've been in charge for 13 years. I mean, it's on your watch, all this. You can't but, blame but, it but, on some mythical other government but but vladimir putin invaded oh, ukraine um, last year yeah the pandemic uh, now these have been a difficult oh, these back black swan events that weren't forecast or weren't expected well they certainly weren't expected back in 2010 or even in 2015 or even to be frank in 2019 taxes why can't you say we're going to cut taxes if we're in the next general election well i think the priority at the moment is delivering lower inflation people are definitely feeling the pinch with higher bills that, I think, is where people want us to concentrate on. And that is where the focus is. Uh, we also have the focus on reducing debt, uh, growing the economy as well. Of course, we would like to be reducing taxes at the right time. So what's the reason, then, if you're Troy, to vote for the Conservatives, if you haven't got the sunny up plans of getting more money back from the government? Is it well, an issue of competency against risk? Is that the point? I think there's two parts to that question, Chris. The first is the local elections coming up uh, next week where we're asking people to vote Conservative because Conservative councils ultimately deliver better. They deliver better for less council tax. Conservative councils cost you £80 less on a band D council tax, but deliver more. Is that based more. on some ex external uh, analysis? That is, uh, band D as a comparator is what has always been used as the council tax uh, comparator. Okay. Uh, Conservative councils deliver you more. Conservative councils fill, for example, more potholes than Labour and Lib Dem councils put together. We uh, deliver typically better services as well on council services. So that is the election for next week. We've got some fantastic Conservative councillors, council candidates up for election right the way across England next week. I think in terms of the general election, I don't think people are yet in the mode of uh, thinking about who to choose at the next general election. I think they're much more interested in seeing the Conservative government delivering well and delivering well on the five priorities and making sure that uh, we improve their lives over the next year. And I don't think they're really thinking about an election yet. But will you, you as a party, fight the next election on cutting taxes? That will be a, a differentiation well, with Labour. Again, I think it's uh, too early to tell on that, Chris. Mm -hmm. I think the, the focus at the moment is on delivery this year, and we will see what sort of a prospectus, a manifesto we offer to the country next year. You voted to remain in the uh, Brexit referendum seven years ago now. Do you regret that? Do you wish you voted to leave? No, I don't, uh, Chris, to be honest. Uh, the question as it was at that time in June 2016, looking at the what I knew at the time, it would have been difficult. I mean, emotionally, um, you know, my, mm. uh, my wife German, is German, right. my children are bilingual. English, German. You're bilingual I've yourself, lived, aren't you? I I'm, I'm, wouldn't say I'm bilingual because that is a specific term, okay. but I speak German fluently. I would be able to do this interview in German. But I, I'm not saying you're, you're an easy interviewer, Chris, <laughs> but I would be able to do this in German. So, I mean, emotionally it would have been difficult for me to be anything other, I think, than a Remainer. However, you know, the, it, it's a different question today. And I think 
that Brexit was always a set of challenges and always a set of opportunities. And I think the government now is doing very well on realising on the opportunities and doing well as well on minimising those challenges. So on the opportunities, I've long been a trade minister, I've been a trade minister for a large part of the last uh, six years, and delivering, for example, on joining the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP Free Trade Area, that is an amazing achievement, something the EU is not able to do, would not be able to do, but opens up growing uh, markets in the Far East for the UK, and that is a fantastic opportunity. So I don't regret that either. I mean, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. And critics say we've lost uh, access to a big market on our doorstep, the EU. And the- well, we haven't lost access to the EU market. You know, we've got a entirely a quota-free, tariff-free trade agreement uh, with the EU. We need to be exporting more to the EU. That is definitely a challenge that the government is aware of. So we've got more to do in trade with the EU. We need to be exporting more to the EU. Um, But that's something that also Kemi Badenoch, the whole team at Department for for Business and Trade, is working hard on. We're reporting today that this retained EU law bill is not going to get rid of 4,000 measures from the statute book, but only as few as 800. I mean, 20% of the total number because of a a delay in, in working through all the different measures. I hadn't seen that report, Chris. No, but it's concerning. I mean, do you think that... The benefit of Brexit is not being taken advantage of by the by your government. Well, no, I don't agree with that. And I think uh, trade is a classic example, having a different regulatory approach. I think uh, financial services, some of the things that are going on in science and technology, I think, are uh, showing the opportunities that are there. That is what is key, is, is taking advantage of those opportunities. I, I've never been a believer in all those kind of uh, meaningful votes in 2018, 2019. (laughs) I was never in favour of doing something like staying in a customs union, staying in the single market. I very much took the view the UK, the electorate voted uh, decisively to leave the European Union. That is what the people want us to do. And that is what we have delivered on. Mm. And we now need to maximise the opportunities from doing that. When is next election, general election? Well, uh, it's it's not my job to set the election date. It's my job to be ready. What are the, the two party windows? To be ready for May when, and, for and when the fem- prime minister decides yeah. to make that decision. You know, it has to be held, as you know, uh, by January 2025. I think it's too early to um, start speculating about a specific date. Has work started on the manifesto yet? No work has started on the manifesto yet. We are still, as I said, very much in the mode of delivery delivering on the people's priorities, getting to grips with inflation, uh, with debt, with growth, uh, hospital waiting lists, and small boats. You, you mentioned, like, as I said, you wouldn't, wouldn't end up, but you did manage to get them in again, second time, well done. Small boats, when were the first flights to Rwanda take off? Well, that I don't know. It's working its way through the courts at the moment. Mm-hmm. Government is fighting Appeal those court, now, court cases uh, really hard. Sorry. <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me. That's a campaign um, cold. Listeners. It might be. I don't think it's a cold. It might be a spot of um, hay fever or something. But, um, but yes, but, the, but, but stop the boats means stop the boats. So when do the first flights take off to deter the, the people, people who are making that perilous crossing across well, the Well, I think channel? as soon as we've worked through those court cases... This year? The government, well, it's, uh, that's in the hands of the, of the courts, how quickly we can work through those courts cases. But we, we're very, very keen. We're committed to the Rwanda project, committed to uh, making those flights happen just as soon as we're able to. And it's not unfair or cruel to people who are sent to Rwanda? Me. Well, no, no, I don't think it is. I, I, I think other European countries are following a similar approach, either with Rwanda or with other partners. I think it's an entirely reasonable, sensible course of action. So the government has got my, my full spot. I think the British people support it as well. You've been well known on Twitter for sharing a letter from Liam Byrne that, uh, that warned the incoming Tory Lib Dem government in 2010 that there's no money left. You've retweeted it so far. 29 times in your 68 days as chairman. Why are you obsessed about news 13 years ago, Greg Hans? Because I think it illustrates what a lot of people know or suspect uh, that Labour governments are terrible at running the country's public finances and that successive Labour governments in my lifetime uh, have left the country with no money. So it's Um, a reminder. It is a reminder, pointing out to people that that it was was Labour who who left us with that uh, legacy in 2010. And it is a clear reminder, the, the letter from the then Chief Secretary of the Treasury. And is the letter anywhere near your purse at the moment? I, it's in my pocket. I thought so. Th- this uh, 
Is it fair, though, to do that to Labour, given Liam Byrne is nowhere near the top of the party and it was a while ago and you've been in power for 13 years, is it not a bit lame not to find a new thing to attack Labour with than rely on the attack? Oh, well, we, I mean, there's plenty of current reasons not to vote Labour as yeah. well, Chris, if that's what you're looking for me <laughs> no, to talk no, about. No, no, OK, OK. I mean, I think the fact that Keir Starmer has not cut through with the public, that Keir Starmer has changed his view on almost everything, going back to Brexit, you know, this is the man who uh, did want okay. to have a second referendum. He wanted to vote Remain and now he's talking about the opportunity are you finding it's polling well then is this letter remembered by people is that the point is that why you was that why you're pulling it out all the time with your pocket well i think uh, i think we're making a, a, a very important point about labor that uh, last time around they were terrible at running the public finances they left the country in a position where for every four pounds the government was spending one pound was borrowed there's no way that you can have your public finances your personal finances sustainable uh, at that level, the, the, the position that Labour left us in in yes. 2010. But the, the, the choice of 24 tax rises and the Rishi Sunak, as Keir Starmer said in Prime Minister's questions this week, tax burden at a, at a, at a 70 year high, however high it is. I mean, the Tories' record in the economy is being criticised by, by your opponents, isn't it? Yeah, but, but I think all of those attacks have at their root either the increased spending from the pandemic or as a result of higher energy prices driven by Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. I might also add, I don't think Labour are pledged to reduce any of those taxes or reverse any of those taxes. I think people know that the Conservative Party is more likely to be delivering lower taxes in the future than any alternative Labour government under Keir Starmer would. That is also really important. And your party isn't out of ideas. Some people say privately... A, a period in opposition might be a good thing for the Tory party. Uh, that, that, that's a terrible idea. There's no, it's not a good idea for the Conservatives to be in opposition. The important thing that is for Rishi Sunak to be competently getting on with delivering good governance. You're chairman of the party. You've got to find a new candidate to fight Sadiq Khan in London mayoral elections next year. We've got Samuel Kasumu on our on our podcast this week. Will he be your candidate? Well, uh, it's up up to the London Conservative Party members to make that choice. I'm confident there'll be a really good list of candidates going to the membership, to the wider party. There'll be a number of candidates going forward and then to the, the hustings, uh, two or three candidates, and then to a ballot by all London Conservative Party members. When's that? Uh, this in September time? In, in due course. Well, it would be, we're going to be setting out the timetable uh, for when that will happen, but that will happen. We'll have a candidate in place uh, before the summer recess. And you, you can get a good, a good challenge, can you, to Sadiq Khan? Well, I think from the, what I know about the candidates who are interested in going for it, and uh, nominations have yet to open, uh, but I think we'll have a strong field and we'll have an excellent candidate uh, to take that fight to Sadiq Khan, who has been appalling for London. He has been, uh, uh, I think, probably the worst but mayor But London's London. a Labour city, isn't it? You've well, got no, to I, d- I, I disagree. I disagree. I know you're I a Tory MP for an in London seat. But. I, I think a good candidate would be very capable of winning that race. Sadiq Khan is unpopular, polls worse than the Labour Party. I think with a good candidate, we can we can unseat Sadiq Khan. OK. Well, Greg Khan is a Tory party chairman here in Lewis in a pub. We like pubs, don't we? Thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics Podcast. Thank you. Greg hands there with some news about when the Conservatives might select a candidate to fight Sadiq Khan, who's going for his third term as Labour Mayor of London next May. And I'll be talking to one of those possible candidates right after this. War in Ukraine is reshaping our world. For the past 12 months, the Telegraph's team of experts in London and correspondents on the ground have been analysing Putin's invasion of Ukraine every weekday on the Ukraine The Latest podcast. With over 24 million listens, Ukraine The Latest is the go-to source for up-to-date analysis on the war from every angle. Military, humanitarian, political, economic, historical, just to name a few. Each episode, we unpack the past 24 hours of the conflict, as well as regularly being joined by our own on-the-ground correspondents and guests who take us into their own experience of the war. Search for Ukraine The Latest in the same place you're listening to this podcast and follow the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Thank you for listening. And we're back. Now, before travelling down to Lewis, we were in our usual pub, The Red Lion, in Westminster. 
where I bumped into Samuel Kasumu, who has emerged this week to be the Tory frontrunner for their mayoral candidate in next year's London mayoral elections. After he received the backing of Grant Shapps and Steve Baker, both government ministers, and former Home Secretary Priti Patel. Samuel Kasumi, welcome to Chopper's Politics Podcast. Great to have you on. Oh, thanks for having me. Now, you had, you had trouble finding the red line today. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, some of my old number 10 colleagues uh, were walking past and they, they yeah. were able to point me in the right direction. Now, you, you, you've emerged this week as the frontrunner for the Tory candidature to fight Sadiq Khan in next year's London mayoral elections. It's always a problem, and I've been covering politics for 20 years, for the Tories to find a candidate. Back in the day, I mean, they, they, Boris Johnson emerged on late ahead of the 2008 mayoralty. Why you? Well, firstly, you know, in a political race, it's not about where you start, it's where you finish. So we are not complacent. Um, We know that there is a need for an Achillean effort for us to be able to make the case for why I think I'm the best candidate. Uh, Why I think I'm the best candidate is for a number of reasons. Firstly, I have extensive political experience. I joined the party as a 19-year-old, been a campaigner, started in Chipping Barnet, North London. I've been a councillor, cabinet member for climate change and environment. I was the candidate in Coida North at the 2017 general elections, where I learned so much from working alongside Gavin Barwell. And I've worked in Downing Street and, 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 and. And so, you know, there's there's a CV there. But also, my science is being able to engage with people from different backgrounds. That is why I played a leading role in the the first one of the COVID-19 vaccines. And I want to bring that science and that know-how to this campaign. You're 34. You know, 35. 30, forgive me, 35. <laughs> 36 in all this. So soon you'll be, won't mind me saying you're younger than you are, but okay, I'll take that from you. But you are... Never been an MP, have you? Now, previous candidates for mayoralty have always been an MP, haven't they? Yeah, but uh, in my opinion, being a mayor is very similar to being a councillor, because especially a cabinet. Because you're a councillor now in Well and Hatfield. Yeah, because you? you have you, you have control of budgets, etc. Whereas if you're a member of parliament, there's a slightly different constitutional role that you play. And so I think I have enough skills to that are transferable for this particular job. And also, there are very amazing mayors uh, across the country who also never mem- um, MPs. You know, Andy Street was never MP, and as far as That's I'm right. aware, Ben. Howell who I went to visit just a month ago yeah. uh, as part of my, you know, Tees Valley. Yep, work experience, fact finding mission, also wasn't a member of parliament. At what point do you look in the mirror and say, Samuel Kasuma, I can see you being the mayor of London? Uh, That's a big moment, isn't it, in your life? When was it? What was the day? Well, I, I don't think that time has ever come. Okay. Uh, I've had it. You a want convers- to be mayor, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, I've, I've, I've so it must a, be coming. I've had a conversation with the wife, and her, uh, her <laughs> response was, well, if you want to do it, I'll support you, but just make sure you, you, you recognise you still have to do the dishes and you still have to pick up the kids. Um, so <laughs> that's the social contract that I'm under. Okay. Uh, but on a serious note, after I left Downing Street in 2021, and I spent the last 18 months writing a book, travelling the world, um, speaking to many political leaders about you know what the future of conservatism looks like, uh, and then it dawned on me that actually a period of modernisation will have to return, and I feel like I want to play a very significant role in that. And I also think that London is the best platform to begin. That Your book's called The Power of the Outsider, yep. l- launching soon, and you're you're looking to sell out the Hackney Empire yep. for a big Q and A with uh, Tim Campbell from The Apprentice. Mm-hmm. Um, that's tickets going for fifty nine pounds each at the top price. Well, they're, they're, Will you sell out? There are literally 20 tickets that are going for that price. Okay. Um, and so the average price is about 25 quid. Oh, fine, fine. And we're fairly confident the marketing begins properly on Friday and we're, we're, we're sure we're going to have a full house. And more importantly, a very good conversation, an interesting conversation about the future of London, the future of this okay. country. Let's come on into, into your policy platform in a second. Why do you leave number 10? Did you fall out of Boris Johnson? Because you were his point person on liaising with the black community, weren't you, in the, in the UK? Well, well, not just. So my portfolio was civil society and communities, and right. part of that meant uh, how we engaged with Britain's minority ethnic population, uh, which, again, is part of the science. But you quit, and no one knows why. Well, uh, yes, that is a good point. Uh, not nobody. Some people do know. Um, I don't know, and I'm meant to know yeah, what's going on. Yeah, I mean, firstly, me and Boris Johnson, for the Royals of Doubt, did not fall out. Um, we had a very good relationship. He was always very supportive about all of the work that I oversaw. And actually, when I left, he didn't want me to go. And number 10, for most of the times when I was there, was a very collaborative environment. I felt very happy to work there and function there. It was a tough, tough, tough job. And so a point came when there were some tensions about some of the direction of travel. Which bits of it? Was it COVID linked? I mean, it was 2021. Yeah, I mean, I was involved as in vaccine deployment and before that, you know, trying to stop as many people as possible from dying from the... Um, so, so, so what was the division that forced you out? I mean, some of it was around, you know, how you make the case for some of the conservative 
ideals that we are probably we were mostly aligned on and some so i think sometimes when you don't agree with people the best thing to do is to get them around the table and try to be respectful about how you articulate that difference and i also think that uh, if you are maybe at times a bit too aggressive mm. uh, it may work for you in the short term but in the long term people that was the vote leave campaigning and i saw that personally when they won the election in 2019 i couldn't believe the way they were still fighting the fights really once they get one power is crazy but well, you know i always tell people politicians usually remember or think about the next election whereas a statesman or a public servant thinks about the next generation and so as someone who is very passionate about conservatism and conservative policies i'm very focused on how do we make sure that the next generation know that this is the best way to govern and and you don't do that by hitting them over the head or calling them names in my opinion in my opinion well, and see. not everybody that's agrees absolutely but, credible, you know, yeah. samuel so Boris Johnson is the most successful Tory ever to run for London Mayor. Is he back in your campaign? Wait and see. Is he back? Because you, well, you and me in the pub, no one's here pop from the <laughs> She's half asleep in the corner after an award suit last night. Well, is, Where was my he, invite? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't win by it again. Okay, but well, I, I forget that. Did, did, did you <laughs> if I'm mayor, you will be winning. I'm joking. <laughs> so he, he might back you. So where he'd we, be a great endorsement for you, wouldn't he? But look, Boris Johnson, as you say, was a very successful mayor, and and it just goes to show that you can be a conservative and a successful mayor in London. So anyone who thinks that's not the case okay. is completely wrong. What I would say is, as you've mentioned, uh, people are saying I am the front runner right now, but it's not where you start; it's where you finish. We have a very clear campaign. This has been you know eighteen months, two years in the making, yeah. and so people just will just have to wait and see. Okay, but you have got the backing of Pretty Patel, Grant Shapps, Steve Baker. Those are big, big beasts. Use that term in, in Westminster. What is your policy platform? What will you do differently? You're concerned about the ULES zones, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, on ULES, my position is very clear. I think that Sadiq Khan has no mandate for spending over three hundred million pounds or an extension that most people in outer London seem to not want and so i urge him to stop and to wait and to put it to the people in the next election if he thinks it's the right thing to do if he doesn't do that and if the court proceedings are not successful then we're going to have to find solutions come may to so would you court. drop it in outer london what look, because, because the, 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 to explain to listeners if you don't live in london you, you pay to drive in if you're in a, in a kind of polluting vehicle and it seemed to be damaging to so-called white van men or women, people who, who, who need to get to yeah. work, maybe public service workers, nurses, and others who drive into London to exactly. work. Yeah, my position is, first and foremost, I'm a fiscal conservative. And so I'm deeply uncomfortable with the idea of somebody spending three to 400 million, maybe even more uh, pounds in me just saying today that I'm definitely going to just reverse it. I think because of the nature or the extent of the expenditure, it's only right for people to have a choice. You know, so once we get to May 2024, what do you want? So borough by borough. Borough by borough. Guaranteed you're going to have a local an opportunity referendum. to have a local referendum. Now, the thing is, in the UK, it's not something that is very common. But in other countries like... Uh, but people outside London on the, on the boundary can't vote in those, in those referendums, can they? It's only those living there. Yes. Um, and I think that is uh, the, the, fair, the fair thing to do. Because they're paying the rates. They're exactly. paying the taxes. Exactly that. Um, having said that, I'm very cognizant of the fact that some very important public servants, nurses, healthcare workers who live just outside London will struggle with the ULIS charge and we need them to come in because we need folks to look after them as well. You want to signal local support for the ULES, but what about pollution, that kind of thing? I, yep. Suppose, yep. I suppose if there's big concerns about pollution, they vote for it, don't they? And that means you're not... Imp- no, uh, not necessarily. I mean, that, that's what justifies it for Sadiq Khan, right? Yeah, not, not necessarily because I think that y- there is so much more you can do. I'm a cabinet member for the environment and climate change and so this is my science as well and so i know that the things you can do around decarbonization of buildings encouraging people to reduce their food waste etc there's a long list of things you're a counseling well in hatfield but you live in london do you i have a place in barnet but me and my family are in the process of moving back so, so a second uh, home in barnet yeah and then, you live outside london yeah and uh, but i'm london born and bred born in paddington grew up in, yeah. in barnet and and on my way back home to serve the people of london what's the what's the qualification to be london mayor if you don't live here I think it, it is a is a qualification. And one of the reasons why I... You were born here, brought yeah, up here, but you yeah. moved to Burn Hatfield and yeah. moved back. And one, one of the reasons why I moved out is because I, I faced the same challenges as so many Londoners. I couldn't afford to buy a place in London. It's only now I'm lucky enough to have the capital to be able to do so. And so, you know, it's, it's a homecoming, but also to serve the people and to improve outcomes for folks who've had the similar challenges as myself. So away from you, Les, what else will you do? You'll First and foremost... Biggest challenge is the housing crisis. And as I say, one of the reasons why I ended up outside of London is not because I necessarily wanted to, but because I couldn't afford at the time to, to, to 
buy a home for my family, right? Which again, that's something I can do now. So housing number one on my agenda. Number two is around uh, this idea of aspiration and opportunity. I want to make North London the cybersecurity capital of, of Europe. I want to create hundreds of thousands of jobs and I've committed to setting up a 100 million pound fund for founders from underrepresented backgrounds to, to really turbocharge business and entrepreneurship, dealing with some of the challenges around uh, financial services and our competitiveness. And number three uh, is of course, dealing with the issue of crime, improving trust and confidence in the police, but not just that, uh, making sure that the police know that I'm on their side. Yeah. Um, You're uh, the boss of the Met Police Chief. And, and this is the thing, I think sometimes Sadiq Khan forgets that he is the boss, he's the strategic head. He is the one responsible for all the outcomes, not uh, so Mark, I mean, he did force uh, out Chris Cresta Dick eventually, didn't he? He lost confidence in her. Yeah, but, you know, it's easy to get rid of somebody to make yourself look good. It's, it's less easy to have a very clear plan about how you're going to improve things. Have you met him yet? Sadiq, yeah, we've been in the same room together. He's not always very friendly with me, especially once he, once he found out that, you know, I may or may or may not be running. And, and he seems to be stealing some of my policy ideas, but that's fine. <laughs> you can take that. <laughs> we have plenty more, so he can keep the, stealing the, them. The big issue for some Telegraph readers is the so-called culture wars, statues, that kind of thing. Yeah. The Corporation of London and everyone's re lots of big institutions, big moneyed institutions in London are reviewing their history with the slave trade. And, and yeah. do, you, do you approve of pulling statues down, covering up f pictures, rehanging walls in, in museums of, with, with questionable art? Well, firstly, I saw the Prime Minister's comments at PMQs yesterday and I agree with him. I don't think Britain should uh, apologise for the role that they played in, or we played in the transatlantic slave trade for a number of reasons. I think a lot of people don't realise that uh, before um, William the Conqueror arrived here on the, uh, in 10, 1066, Britons actually enslaved themselves. Um, <laughs> okay. and, and, then, and it was the Normans that thought that was barbaric. And so uh, as a result, they, they abolished. Yes. So the, how far do you go back yeah. is your point. How, yeah, well, how far do you, do you go back? Where do you stop apologizing? Because I think every single person probably has an ancestor somewhere who, is, who was involved in some kind of evil act or activity that will have had a, a material impact of, around where we are today. But I think the more broader point is I, th I think most people from African and Caribbean backgrounds and beyond are more interested in how you improve the lots of people that are here today and also future generations. So there's two things are, I'm, I'm completely passionate about and committed to. One is dealing with the disparities that still exist in some circles and spaces. Uh, and, and number two is improving relationships with Commonwealth countries uh, across the world. And, and that is, they, 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 they are two things that will be a priority for me. If are I you letting that. down other black people saying that? No, I think my record on serving people from all backgrounds is very clear. I mean, I, when I was 19, I set up a student network for students from underrepresented backgrounds. The search firm that I set up focuses on helping people have access to board board opportunities. So, you know, I'm not a culture warrior for the violence of doubt, but I focus on the substance and delivery. And I, as I say, I think my record is very clear. Well, Samuel Kasomu, thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics Podcast. It's great to have you on. And let's see what happens in the next eight, next twelve months. Well, the election is twelve months this, next week. Well, this is it. And if if <laughs> if if I am lucky enough to still be the front runner <laughs> at the end of this election, you'll come on the podcast again. Make sure you have me back. Of course, I will. Now, don't forget your mug. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you. Samuel Kasumu there. Well, that's all this week's Choppers Politics listeners. Thank you to my guests, Maria Caulfield MP, Greg Hans MP, and of course Samuel Kasumu. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells and Giles Gear. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do leave us a rating and a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find this show when they're looking for one. For daily insights into the world of Westminster, please do sign up to my daily Choppers Politics newsletter. It arrives straight in your email inbox every weekday. And the link for that will be in the show notes this episode. And don't forget to read my weekly Peterborough Diary Gossip column out every Friday at 7pm online and in Saturday's copy of The Daily Telegraph. As always, please do buy a copy of The Telegraph if you can. Until next time, though, from the Anchor Pub here in Ringma, cheerio!